good evening again to everybody and warm, warm welcome to um, this Film Thinking event. Um, uh, so Film Thinking is a, is a uh, I'm repeating what I said earlier before the film, but I'll say it again. Film Thinking is a, a series hosted by the Kogut Institute for the Humanities. And tonight's event is a co-production with the um, Pembroke Center's LGBTQIA plus uh, thinking series that uh, Lynn Joyrich hosts. My name is Tim Buse, and I'm delighted to be here with you all and with our guests for today's conversation. We've been watching um, Todd Haynes's 2002 film, Far From Heaven, and we're joined by Lynn Joyrich, Professor of Modern Culture and Media at Brown, who is acting as the curator of today's uh, film, as well as Patricia White at the end of the um, uh, row there, uh, um, who is um, who teaches film and media studies at Swarthmore College and who coordinates the gender and sexuality studies program there. And finally, uh, Leon Hilton from the Department of Theatre and Performance Studies here at Brown. I'm really delighted to have you all uh, to talk about this film. And I want to begin the conversation with, with Lynn, who selected Far From Heaven um, alongside, with, in conversation with Patty, I think, to some extent, um, to, to, for us to look at. And Lynn, you wanted to present the film as a collaboration with LGBTQIA plus thinking, the, the series you host for, for Pembroke. No one can fail to notice the word thinking in both of the series of these, uh, in both the titles of these series. So I want to ask you, first of all, um, what is LGBTQIA plus thinking? What makes Far From Heaven a work that is appropriate for the series? Is there a sense in which for you, uh, Far From Heaven or, or Todd Haynes in this film is doing uh, a certain kind of thinking work? And is that work, I mean, ir sort of irrepressibly have to ask you, is that work, work the, the thinking work that he's doing or that the film is doing and would you want to differentiate between that, the work that the film is doing and the work that he is doing? And is that work queer in some sense? And if so, you know, how would you sort of identify that, yeah. that work? Yeah. Um, thanks. Can, can people hear me? Do I need to move this or you can hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Tim. Thank you in general for the film thinking series, which as you heard at the beginning, I'm a regular attender. Um, and I really appreciate it. I think it's a great series, and so I, everybody should go to all of them. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for the opportunity to do this one. Thank you for the question. Um, I chose Far From Heaven it, because I do think it is the perfect text for a collaboration between film thinking, the Cognitive Institute's film thinking, and the Pembroke Center's LGBTQA plus thinking series. Um, not only because uh, Tom Haynes, who is, I, I would note, a Brown alum, uh, not only because of his status as really a, a leader in queer cinema, one of the initiators of what's been called new queer cinema, for example, but also, I think, because of the way that he really is somebody, I think, who's an example of what I would call film thinking. In other words, I think that he's somebody who very much across his work in this film across his work tries to use cinema very self-consciously as a means of exploring, reflecting on, critically examining the, you know, ourselves and our worlds, including our media worlds, and so shows how film, media more generally, right, given his engagement, again, in this film, but across his work, his engagement with sound and music, his engagement with uh, television and video, with art, with performance, right? I think that he very much across his work and in this film shows how media can operate in some ways as a kind of epistemological, media can operate as epistemological formations that help us see and reflect on social formations, right? And, and like in this case, formations of gender, sexuality, race, class, et cetera. Um, often, in fact, typically, I think, viewers or consumers who are drawn into media texts and melodrama, of course, right, often called like two jerks, right, the, as if the genre has this ability to like literally like wrench tears on it. So often viewers or consumers drawn into media texts are typically seen as kind of pacified dupes on media 
And usually there are gender and class and racial and sexual connotations to that, that being immersed in a text, being kind of sucked in as a consumer or being hyped up as a kind of fan, right, which comes from the word fanatic, um, has been considered to be, you know, a feminized position or a primitive position. It means to be unintelligent, to be unsophisticated, to be either over tranquilized by the text or, or the flip side of that, overstimulated by the text. But one of my interests, in fact, my own scholarship is very much about the way in which it's not that media stop us from thinking. I'm very much interested in the way in which we think through the media, like literally think through the media, the more media forms give us the very categories and modes through which we think. And again, for me, Haynes is a very interesting director because I think of the way that, I'm interested in the way that he explicitly plays that up in his work, the way that he uses cinematic categories to kind of comment on, open up certain modes of, of thinking. So as I talk about in the excerpt uh, that was in the film note for, for this screening, so it's an excerpt from a piece that I wrote about this film, one of the things I'm interested in is how, and, and I know that I think Pat and Leah are interested in this too, is how this film, of course, is so self-reflexive, and it's a, you know, obviously kind of remaking, a, a reworking of a 1950s melodrama, which itself is reworking of other kinds of film conventions. So it gets us very much to reflect on film through its, you know, specific film references and homages, but it also incorporates multiple media form. So not just film, but photography, the press, uh, the telephone, uh, the in key moments, television, etc. And then and the way that it brings those in at certain key moments and uh, key functions intersects with or has an effect on the way that we reflect on certain social issues of gender and class and sexuality. And race. So, for example, and again, I could elaborate on, on these, but for example, the way that the film uses the scenes of Frank at the movie theater, the Ritz Theater, or choosing to, to walk away from the movie theater, right? It can use that to comment on even in terms of what's playing at the Ritz and which ones he chooses to see or to leave, right? Can comment on questions of visibility or invisibility, choosing to watch or not watch the public and the private, the melodramatic or the medicalized, right, which then is a choice he later faces. Uh, likewise, you know, Kathy chooses to discuss the narrative plausibility of her relationship, that's the word she uses, with Raymond under the marquee of the Ritz Theater, where they're also leading to this spectacle when, when people, you know, watch them. They're also related to a spectacle at the ocean, where instead of you know her being able to enjoy things as a spectator, she, her and Raymond become a spectacle. So you know comments on that. Uh, one of the things I write about is the use of all the telephone calls within that the film, and there's many, many, many telephone calls that almost act as these kind of call and response sort of. It's kind of a rocking pattern, opening up and closing down certain communicative and relational possibilities and, and opens up or, like I said, closes those. And then, of course, I'm very interested in, in the use of television in the film, in the way that, you know, they're, they're framed, literally framed, as Mr. and Mrs. Mack, the tape, right, and the image of that as Mr. and Mrs. Mack, the tape, that's framed in their house, and also framed at the elevator, the scene of literally the ups and downs of sort of their life. Um, and even who's watching television or not watching television, Right, like when Frank is, is uh, kind of calling the room from lunch or television, and what's on is the reports of, the, of what's going on in terms of the integration, in terms of the, the little right of calling the troops in, and the way that that issue of what television is trying to contain within the sect but can't fully contain, right, is it ends up being, you know, in, in a way, ignored by them, even, you know, so what, what you know, how those media operate. So again, I think that the film, um, those things are interwoven, the way that the film employs and comments on media engagements, disengagements, how it contains, how it doesn't contain, what it opens up, is intimately interwoven with how it comments on these just issues of gender, sexuality, race, and class. 
and gets us out of it to, to ourselves think about how those cannot be thought about separately. We need to think about how those set social issues are mediatized, right? And how media are always socially determined. They are mutually constructed. So in that way, for me, the, the film, and that's a good question, is that who's doing the work, the film doing the work and the viewers doing the work kind of bring it together. But I think it shows how the way the kind of queer thinking of the film is inseparable from the film thinking of the film, right? And it makes, I think the value of this is that it shows that we need to think those things together. And I think, again, that that itself is a sort of queer and feminist and anti-racist, I would say, I don't know, opinions makes us think about the way these things are interwoven and, and inseparable. So that's sort of okay. So, that question. No, thank, thank you, Luke. So I want to ask a follow-up, which I, actually I'm going to pose to all, to all three of you. One of the conversations I was having during the break was whether this film is legible as a parodic film in 2022 in the same way that it would have been legible in 2002. In, in, in so far as we would immediately, in 2002, we knew that this film was quoting Hollywood conventions in a way that it's not. It, when I was watching it now, I was not... I was thinking about this. Would a, for example, a young audience not aware of the of the of the history of Hollywood cinema be able to read it as parodic in the same way that it, it would have been in two thousand two? In other words, what are the formal qualities of this film that that insist upon a kind of parodic or a queer um, or a critical reading? And Lynn, I want to first just quote something that you say in in your piece that we. Circulated, and if you didn't pick up one of these film notes, please do so on the way out because it has this lovely um, piece uh, by Lynn, in which she says the following: Media immersions, in media immersion, need not be opposed to critical distanciation. So, a, you know, a strong, a really strong statement. Rather, media critique can arise with and through exactly that immersion, yielding a particular kind of queer feminist approach. And I understand you, Lynn, to be really making an argument that is counter to the kind of um, forms of non-identification or disidentification that we might associate with Brechtian, you know, dis, dis, you know, estrangement technique. So, you know, I, I, I wonder what thoughts that you, you have about those formal modes of critical distanciation in, in, the, in the film. And then, and I'd like to sort of maybe extend that to something that Patricia White um, or has also written about, about Haynes's work as a queer representational practice. And I was intrigued, um, Patty, about something that you said in your, in your piece, a question that you asked, very interesting. What does Haynes's approach permit in the present moment of queer representation? And you go on, how does the film you're talking about, Carol, uh, but you ask, how does the film activate the force of the queer and movie past, and for whom? So those words, permit and activate, capture for me, I think, the challenges of Far From Heaven also. So I, I, I'd be interested in whether you would like to elaborate on those procedures um, uh, in Far From Heaven as you understand them, um, particularly in the service of this kind of activation of the force of the past mm -hmm. and then I'd, I'd also like to, to maybe maybe extend that question to to leon also and maybe to sort of think about again i mean this is a i mean lynn has written about that so have you patty that this Haynes practice in in this film in particular is a deep engagement with douglas surf cinema um how is this why is this not a film by douglas surf mm -hmm. and uh, why is this a film by todd Haynes? and how is the film sort of legible in, uh, as a kind of queer filmmaking practice. Mm. Lucas. <laughs> so I can say something quick, but I don't want to take up too much time because I feel like I've talked a lot already. But um, in terms of your first question, uh, would it be good to now? That's a really <laughs> interesting question. And whether people watch it and do they just think like, oh, that's just an old fashioned film that they were making or two, you know, at that time, instead of seeing it as already, a reference, you know, a play with the historical as opposed to it's just historical. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question, and maybe maybe younger people in the audience can answer the question. But we're going to open things up. But I do think that there's a way in which Haynes's work in general. I mean, it rewards the cinephile, and it rewards the television, and it rewards the 
can't build a picture of that more because the more you're immersed, again, this goes to the other one, because the more you're immersed in the media, the more you recognize the references, and then you know that he's playing with them. So, and in well, again, the more immersed you are, the more distance, distanciation in the way it's possible. In terms of the great confession, I actually would say I'm making an argument against the sort of Brecht argument. I think I would say I'm making one that extends it to the side because it's like, Brecht himself was really interested in the uses of the popular to produce distanciation. So I would say it's extending it. I, and I would, again, try to call attention to the way that often the way a sense of having to be distanced is very gender coded, sexual coded, racially coded. Class color, but it seems as a, you know one needs to be above mass culture because it's a feminized position. It's an over sexualized position, right? Like you know, over sexual, like incel guys, you know, get too involved with their fan culture, right? Or over hyped, you know, over sexualized women who want to like rip Elvis's clothes off. Is one example or primitive viewers or you know women watching soap, so women watching their weepy. So I feel like that sense of the way that being too involved is already coded in all those ways. Whereas I want to look at how no immersion can in fact be a route towards those. We can break that binary and it's precisely by breaking that binary and trying to think of, of how there's, there's things in between. That's what makes it a queer, I think, position. Is that he's he's part of that? So that's would be my answer. But what what do my brilliant colleagues think? Well, uh, when you first asked the question, I was thinking um, about whether the past is activated and how the past is activated, and I thought this film is such an argument for film teaching. <laughs> and so I just was up there going, oh, I really want to show people the shot from. Um, imitation of life that's being quoted there, or the shot from um, uh, Reckless Moment, the Max Opal's film that's also extremely um, uh, structured in there. And I think that that's pleasurable and I agree with you. And to go back to the kind of binarism, what we have is the sort of thinking feeling binarism. And I think, <laughs> or I feel, um, that the film doesn't necessarily need to be placed historically, either you know in the mid fifties or in two thousand two, to have the feeling come through as a prompt to thought, right? Because you just are overfeeling. It is melodrama with that Elmer Bernstein score. It is the color, which is about the affective attachments to these colors, and I feel that. Parody isn't exactly what I would call that. I've, it's it's a route to kind of affective reserves that I think are attached to the cinematic. I think would feel probably to younger viewers as um, their mother's cinema or probably more their grandmother's cinema. And but that that is um, that that it still kind of works. And I guess Todd has said that, you know, he thought people would have to know all of these references or, you know, some certain pleasure out of those references, as I think William has talked about, but that people could also watch it quote unquote straight, which would mean to watch it queer, right? Would be able to find these affective reserves that are about, you know, having them nurtured in darkness, which I think is a quote that he uses at the beginning of, of, of Poison from from Genet or something like that, yeah. that the cinema did allow for its like secrecy, displacement, weird kinds of cross-gender identifications, all of those things that are kind of encoded into the feel of Hollywood, which this film, you look at it and it is about high budget. Like you do see ways in which, you know, they're kind of tying, you know, leaves onto the trees with like, you know, a little bit of the scotch tape visible, but that that is activated. And I hope that, but then I realized I just have to do that. I have to perform that with my students to make them feel that this is like, you know, the, um, cinema, cinema love or cinephilia. So that it's, it's a real question. And maybe then it comes across as, as perhaps more parodic than as I think of it as pastiche, but pastiche that just carries not only feeling and style, but also um, 
historical reference, you know, so that kind of does make you want to dig into it a little bit. Um, and just around, because I knew we were called film thinking, I did bring the, the, the quote that Fassbinder, the Fassbinder quote about Cirque that I think is underscoring a little bit what Lynn was saying about, um, about uh, thought in, the, in, in melodrama, which you think of as all about feeling. Um, and Fassbinder says, in Douglas Cirque's movies, the women think. I haven't noticed that with any other director, with any. Usually the women just react, do the things women do, and here they actually think. That's something you've got to see. It's wonderful to see a woman thinking. That gives you hope, honest. And, and I love that, and I think we see Julianne Moore thinking as an actor about how she's portraying this, you know, affectively accessible figure, but who's also in some ways somebody we want to hold at arm's length. And that the film actually holds at arm's length, even though she's hyper present, she's placed in the frame in a way that's not, um, we are not, we are not her. We're always kind of looking at her. And so then he has this other quote that says, and then the people in Cirque's films are all situated in settings that are shaped to an extreme degree by their social situation. The sets are extraordinarily accurate. And that, of course, goes for the pastiche that Haynes and his you know, team do of the Cirque film. In Jane's house, and he's referring to Jane Wyman in um, All That Heaven Allows, which is the primary intertext for this film. In Jane's house, you can only move a certain way. Only certain sentences occur to you when you want to say something and certain gestures when you want to express something. So I feel that there's this really interesting tension then between thinking and being constrained by these social, by the furniture, and that those especially afflict the women who are in those domestic spaces. Um, but, but that's also kind of how we watch the movie, that we're also thinking and we're watching these kind of things play out as they would have played out in the films that he's referencing, but with a twist so that we're made very uncomfortable about like, oh my God, they really are going to have a shot of the, um, uh, the black man who's been hired to uh, serve at the party just as the characters are talking about, you know, there are no black people in Connecticut. We really are going to have that tilt up to that person, which is, you know, demanded by Cirque, but it's also going to make us very uncomfortable with our, you know, thought about that. So I went a little off of what I'm thinking about the sort of queerness or female position there, but I think that, that there's something about the constraint and the, um, the demand to kind of know what you're dealing with that is attached to the, the, um, the, the female character and to that sort of queer desire to see it maybe go otherwise. Um, yeah, I think um, um, I also agree that I don't necessarily read this film as parodic, I guess, maybe parody, I think is maybe not totally how I see it. Um, I think that there's something, um, I think that uh, Haynes talked actually also quotes from something that Fassbender says about Cirque, which is that Cirque um, is able to capture something like direct tenderness. Um, and I think Haynes really kind of like picks up on that. and. Um, and I think that's precisely the, the point that you were making about, um, you know, somebody can, can come into this film not knowing any of the references and have this really rich emotional response and experience. Um, and I think that that's something that Fassbinder really was sort of um, sort of bowled over when he saw Cirque films because he was so shocked that there, there could be such tenderness, you know, sort of portrayed on screen. It's also interesting, I think, to think uh, about the fact that Cirque himself was a theater director. Um, and had directed Brecht. He came from Germany, so he was very, very familiar with, with Brechtian techniques and Brecht himself. And I think, so to think about Cirque and Brecht as kind of in opposition is maybe not, you know, right? Um, and, um, you know, I think in terms of the, the, the question of, of queerness and is this, um, you know, is Haynes' film a kind of um, post-liberation, you know, sort of gloss on the Cirque where the Cirque was all closeted and the, um, Haynes can sort of bring to the surface all of the things that couldn't be said in the 50s. Um, you know, that's potentially one way of reading it, but I don't think it's, I don't necessarily know that it's totally accurate in some ways. 
Um, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting about All That Heaven Allows and Douglas Sirk, you know, 50s melodramas is that they were really important sites of identification for queer people. Um, and that often queer audiences, I think, in, you know, in the 50s and, and beyond, really identified with the female characters who were caught in the trap of, you know, their kind of social situation. Um, so there was a kind of identification with the women um, in, the, in the, the films, right, who couldn't, you know, express their, um, their true feelings. Um, so there's something there that I think that's really important. And then, of course, the other, I think, aspect of um, all that uh, all that heaven allows that's uh, significant for, for this film is the presence of Rock Hudson, right, in the, um, the, uh, the Dennis Haysbert, I guess, the kind of role-ish, um, who obviously was gay, but closeted and forced to marry uh, a woman by Universal Studios, which was the producer, and they, they had like a kind of gay purge in the, in the, right at the moment that this was happening. So there was a kind of forced closeting of Hudson, um, which I think is, is really interesting. And um, in, in, in All That Heaven Allows, the um, Jane Wyman character's husband is dead. And here he's, you know, a closeted gay man. So it's interesting that there's that kind of, yeah. you know, positioning as well. So, um, but, I, but I do think that there's, um, if it's not a parody that's happening, I think it's like, he's sort of like reactivating the mechanisms of melodrama in some kind of way. Um, and he's, because he's also not sort of making, like it's, it doesn't seem to be sort of necessarily on the side of like liberation either in some ways. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a film that actually has a lot of like tenderness and sympathy and like, um, yeah, just sort of feeling for the position of the closet and that closetedness can be, you know, defined in many ways. Um, just to add a, a couple background things. I mean, I think that for those, how many people have seen the, the sort of, again, I think kind of primary reference text, which is All That Heaven Allows. Because All That Heaven Allows, it's, it's really, it's a wonderful Douglas Sirk film. And, and in it, Jane Wyman it, it falls in love with her governor, who is played by Rock Hudson. And it's an illicit romance, really because of class differences and age differences, right? He's a much younger man. Um, and so it, it, I mean, it, within the narrative, again, it's about age and class, but of course, because Rock Hudson, you know, through, through the lens of performances is, and, and we know through, through architectural discourses as a closeted gay man, right? In a way, Haynes sort of separates out some of the issues, right? And then adds an issue that, that from other sort of melodramas like Imitation of Life, for example, the dealt with questions of race, Right, so it's almost like he's kind of deconstructing some of the different shirt ones and, and dividing kind of them out and, you know, through these different things. And melodrama, again, I think is, a, I love melodramas. I think it's a fascinating genre for the way that it can be both so effective and at the same time, it very much calls attention to its style through the kind of heavy investment in objects and the mise-en-scene color very kind of these things that that carry sort of you know grave meaning and so that you're both drawn in and you're led to see the conventions of meaning making at the same time so i i also wouldn't call it clarity but it kind of deconstructs it but i agree with you it's not as if this can only that, that this can deal with all the things that in the 50s couldn't because there's still things that cannot be dealt with here. And in a way, you see the way that queer issues of queerness and issues of race get intersected in a way one also can be the alibi for another in ways that can be problematic. And I think that in this, in a way, one of the things that's fascinating is an absent center, the center of the film, I would argue, but the absent center is the relationship between Julianne Moore, uh, between Kathy and Sybil. I mean, yeah. they're in a way the truth couple of the film, right? And they're the lasting couple of the film. So it's like the, the interracial lesbian couple is the lasting couple of the film. And in that moment when Kathy kind of says, oh, I couldn't do it. And you're waiting for the, the rest of that sentence without you that she doesn't actually say, right? So there's still ways in which, you know, the gap between where the feeling is and what can be expressed is still there even in this version, but, but you, can 
feel that and mm -hmm. think about that in a way. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I think, you know, again, it, it, it still is functioning in, in those ways. Right. And just, to, I mean, just two little um, things to append to your comment is yeah. that the other thing about the melodrama is that they're anti-psychological. So that like all of the, you know, <laughs> there's no, you know, people are acting out these, you know, thwarted desires and these, and, you know, walking the way that they have to walk through the, you know, <laughs> mise-en-scene that has been given them in a, in a, in a grand sense. Right, it's all externalized. The psyche is all external. Right, it's right. The, yeah. So, so you, and so you also get, I think, and both of you have said this, but just to be explicit mm -hmm. about it, like the ways, the things that are uncovered about the 50s the Rock Hudson reference, um, or the, to a certain extent, the sort of lesbian bond between um, uh, them, yeah, Sybil, Sybil, I'm going to say Carol, but it's Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> um, which comes out of, which comes out of imitation of life and also comes out of reckless moment where there's a, a woman named Sybil who is right. doing everything with, you know, kind of keeping the house together that those things are then shown in the idiom of the 50s. So it's not like we're giving back, you know, some other full identitarian right. kind of idea. And that then goes to, I wanted to circle back to your point about like, what is he giving us now? As queer spectators, he's giving us that anti-identitarian, mm -hmm. you know, but also deeply historical, even if it's like movie history kind of way of thinking about how we got to where we are in terms of, sex, desire, race, and, you know, right. the mother. And it, also, I just want to give a shout out that so much also ties to the way you talk about supporting character, for example, the way that queerness can lie in the relations between character, supporting character in, in your wonderful work, Patty. So we see that in this film, too. So. At one point, Haynes says something very interesting, which is that this film puts identification <laughs> into peril, mm. which I think is kind of fascinating. And it just... I just like to ask one one sort of small question. I mean, I think it's small before we open things up, and that is um, around the question of the gaze. Now, obviously, the question of the male gaze is a kind of foundational concept in a way to, to for film studies. Um, and I'm wondering if there is there is a gaze. I mean, I, I love what you said, Lynn, about the fact that in the, in a way, this film is a kind of film about intersectionality. There's an absent center in in, in, the, in the kind of identity or the, the location thinking subject in this mm. film. And, uh, and that is really fascinating. But I, well, one thing I started doing on this, on this um, viewing of the film was counting the number of um, points of view shots mm. in this film. And um, I, I, I watched the film very, you know, on this occasion, focusing on it. And I, I counted one. Is that, that, yeah, there's like three. Yeah, yeah <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, and the, the, the ones that are uh, the, the, that are unambiguous, I think, are very small. But there are many. There are some that are ambiguous. Usually, the, ca the camera will move out of the frame in order to show you that that what you thought might be a point of view shot was in fact not one. That's kind of an ex with one exception, and that is the almost the final shot of the film where um, Raymond is on a train, and mm -hmm. there is a shot counter shot uh, exchange of views. With Kathy, and but it's not her shot. It's not her view of Raymond. It is Raymond's view of Kathy that you see because his um, because you Kathy meets the gaze of the camera, and that's I think it's the only strictly speaking point of view shot in the film, and it's the the the, 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 the mm -hmm. point of view of a, of a black man, and I'm wondering what mm. you think about that, the question of camera view viewpoint, and the question of the gaze. Really. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think it's, um, so now I'm going to do my plug. <laughs> Camera Obscura um, book series at, at Duke University Press recently brought out, and it's a COVID book, so it just needs an extra push. Um, <laughs> um, an anthology called Reframing Todd Haynes, Feminism's Indelible Mark, um, and it's edited by Teresa Geller and Julia Leda. And it has reprinted um, a few really important essays from the journal, including Lynn's that has been accepted here, but also Sharon Willis's um, essay um, about the politics of disappointment. And she also she does a really extended reading of point of view in the film. And, I, and so I'm kind of thinking of that as I'm listening to you, and I think you're absolutely right, is that um, it's not allowing us to stand with the lovers even. Um, and that I think that 
place of judgment of the characters or, you know, um, affective give and take. Uh, sometimes we're those people who are, you know, the shot will go and you'll see like 15 people staring at them. Um, that's directly taken from um, Ali Fury's The Soul, the interim, the remake of All the Heaven Allows that came before Far From Heaven, which Fassbinder, in which Fassbinder has this very strong social gaze. And in some ways it's a much more kind of class conscious, very, and less, it's achingly tender, but it's not kind of with the characters as much as I think this one is. Um, and so, so I think the film tries to get us away from being Kathy, but I'm not sure it fully succeeds. Um, and that, that goes back to the, you know, the sympathy for the woman, the sympathy for the mother, I think, in a way of, of the, a kind of idea of the cinema as a place of, um, or classical Hollywood cinema of a place of sort of affective immersion that could be a little more thoughtful sometimes. And that might be going to the question of, is that really his gaze? If it's just mm -hmm. setting it up for the, you know, that shot is, um, uh, you know, uh, now Voyager, um, Letter from an Unknown Woman, there's like so many of those women standing next <laughs> to um, a, a, a departing train that you're like, you know, the affect is just overwhelming and, and the score really does it here. If it is Raymond's, and I believe you're right, he's being whisked like way off to like the unrepresentable space of, you know, like actual black sociality, which we can't see in this film. So um, anyway, I think they're really interesting, but it's also, that's like why these films are so great to teach because you can say like, well, look where the camera is, you know? Um, there's all these gazes. There's that one from above that's like the punishing God, God, like, you know, you, you people who are going to like thrash about and mm -hmm. never, never work it out. <laughs> I mean, melodrama, one of the, I think, again, melodrama is a fascinating genre because on the one hand, we do in, in, in many ways think that melodrama always, it's giving us the, the gaze of, of the whatever, the, the woman you're identifying. Many melodrama films, and again, especially Serbian melodrama films, Bosmaker, et cetera, and, they're very much their their structure of the gaze is very different. It's very much where again their their affect without necessarily interiority in the same way. It's sort of externalized again yeah. onto mesos, onto objects, and you get a way in which the gaze is dispersed and you can see in a way the intersection. And then when melodrama moves from film to television. Right, um, where one might argue that the melodramatic mode either makes the dominant mode in television, where television partially again because of its own institutional requirements of meeting narratives that will go on and on and narratives that they that, that tend to have multiple protagonists and multiple intersecting narratives that the last as opposed to a singular one, and it's a different mode of melodrama because it's not going to come to an end where you feel, in a way, that gap between what should be but it ends. Like, it can keep going on and on. But nonetheless, with that multiple kind of intersecting melodramatic mode, but the way people have talked in a way about the gaze about the television, of like somebody like classic Soviet or the, the scholar talking about Nikolinsky has this quote that I love so much. It says that like the gaze in television melodrama, the gaze in television soap opera, is that which only a lover or mother <laughs> face in close up, mm -hmm. right? Where you can kind of see the affect on his face, but you're never located with just one of them, that you multiply identify with many characters, all of them, again, like the mother looking at all her children who cannot all be happy at the same time. So it gives you, again, it's, it is sort of like a, a social analysis through affect at the same time. So these genres that we are, that within mass culture, people typically make fun of are very complex genres. And again, on television, you know, which I mean, work on, so of course I'm interested, but it's, you know, the quality genre with a male anti-hero called, you know, the Sopranos, who are wild or whatever, they don't call us. But it, it uses some of the structure. So it's, it's again, bars for a melodrama because of these potentials, including the potential of a multiple gaze that you're getting. 
So we have a little bit of time for um, a larger discussion. We have two roving microphones, one at each side, one at each aisle. So um, there's a question right at the back there. So, so please uh, uh, speak into the mic. Hello, is this working? Um, this is maybe an obvious question, but not so obvious. We haven't touched on it on the visual. What if you decided or been able to afford to make this film in black and white? What would you be saying if it had been in black and white? You notice there was one black and white image in the film, right? From, from Three Faces of Eve on the screen? Well, no, I was thinking of the photograph of the little girl. It's the one black and white image in this, in this film. But... Oh, and, and Eisenhower. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Well, um, I can only... So, but like Rex moment is in black and white and it has a really interesting play on sort of it's a noir it's a noir um but but I think and certainly I feel like I mentioned this I think the projection was a little dark today so I do think there was more that we could see but it's also pretty lit for in film noir there's lots of black in the film and there's a lot of darkness in the film so of course the color level um, and the way that race plays out with, you know, skin color and foliage color and, and all of the ways would be different. But I think it also, there would be, um, yeah. But, but I think we noticed that this film and it was, you know, noted when it, when it hit the, the screens is that it's so saturated and so highly, you know, just blows your mind in terms of, you know, the fall foliage at the beginning and all the way through with the clothing. So I just wondered what you think of a black and white film, would it have been more powerful or much more throwing it back to the past of the 50s? Well, I think color is, I mean, it is it is the expressive, arguably, and music, I guess, medium, I think, of the film. It does, it performs the emotions that the characters, you know, the lack of interiority, right? Um, the colors do it for us. And that's also true in Circuit, and it's also true in The Fassbender, so I watched all three for the weekend, which I highly recommend. It's a great like trilogy to watch. Um, and all three films, red and blue are so, like the use of red and blue is so significant and dominant, and it's like, you can't miss it. They're just like banging you over the head with it. And it's not like each color has a kind of representational meaning necessarily. I mean, I think that certainly like the use of blue light here is like, seems to be the kind of like, shame of the closet light sort of and then the use of green light when they go into the gay bar and then also then they go into the african-american like bar restaurant um like these sort of two spaces of kind of like you know sort of self-segregation or whatever um you know so there's like obviously parallels that are being made with color um but yeah i mean it's like there's a reason you make it a black and white because the color is doing so much work here um and i think it's like yeah it's incredible and so and he's also like referencing, yeah, the the Fassbender and the Cirque, um, and I think it's 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 like a really amazing uh, thing to to see how how it's all coming together over the three films. I mean, I just say a little note that it, 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 the film is shot on film and um, post production on film, like it's pre digital in every way. So the color timing is all, you know, film, which I think is lovely. Is there a question? Hi. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was thinking about the way that the uh, like shady gay male characters were portrayed in the film, like the guy smoking the cigarette mm -hmm. at the base of the stairs. And I guess he was the same guy that was the first one to make eye contact with the main character or the, the guy in the bar. Um, wondering what you all think about those characters and if their portrayal was like critically thought through and how so. It is interesting that that uh, gay male sexuality in this film is so much articulated through the look, right? It's very much like it's the, the, the way they look at each other is is the signal. So I, I think that that's something interesting that, you know, I mean, again, it's through a visual medium that we're seeing this, but it is articulating you know, that through dynamics of looking. Um, that's probably a totally simplistic part, but I don't know, do you guys? 
I mean, one point that I think is interesting to think about is I think it, in an interview I read with Haynes where he said that the film is set in 1957, not in the real 1957, but in the 1957 of the movies. <laughs> so, um, so he is actually playing with these sort of like, you know, historical, this historical archive of images of like epicene gay men, right? And of course, like that, that like uncle who's at the like art opening, who's like coded in this very sort of like mid-century sort of stereotypical gay way. Um, and I think he's almost like, yeah, sort of like referencing this sort of like longer archive of visual representation of gay men as, you know, different typologies and stuff, almost in a kind of like clinical way, like yeah. in some ways. Yeah. yeah. So very thought out, I, I agree. And but just to say that I also think that that's that there is this authorial inscription where it's like okay to be like really creepy about the, the gay stuff. And there's this other kind of distance in terms of how race is dealt with and that those things, um, yeah, I'm curious how they how they play. And also like the intertext of like Carol and Janae and sort of like the pinup, like the gay pinup. Tom of Finland, sort of yeah. um, iconography, right? Where you have the, yeah, I think some like muscle, you know, dudes who are represented in, in certain ways. And also the relationship be between the gay stuff and other things. Like, again, to me, it's interesting that he goes to the movies, he goes to the Ritz Theater, he decides to see Three Faces of Eve, which is about, you know, a woman with multiple personalities that has to be cured to, you know, be a whole normal person again. But he leaves, he's not really paying attention to the movie. He's instead paying attention to the two gay guys flirting, you know, who go off together, right? He watches them sort of go up to the balcony when, you know, presumably they're cruising each other and then he follows them later in the gay bar. So. And then later, in a way, that's the choice he himself is, is faced with. Should he go to the doctor to get the medical cure to be a normal, whole person again? Or, you know, so it's referenced in, in multiple ways, but it, it goes exactly what you were saying, Leanne, that it's like, it's not, it's gay life in relationship to the movies mm -hmm. in, in both, you know, the way it's figured, but even literally the way it's inscribed in the film. Mm -hmm. And, and those, those figures cannot be identified with, right? It's part of the architecture of the interruption of identification, mm -hmm. that, that, as, that perhaps. And there's also that moment when he, as soon as he walks in the gay bar and they say, identification, please. Right. Which, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I wanted to follow up on what you were just talking about. And it just occurred to me that the depiction of the husband as a closeted gay man is in, inordinately cruel. He is the re, he wreaks havoc and cruelty all around him, and it's interesting to me that that choice. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that he could have been depicted, or the fallout from from his um, closeted behavior could have been depicted. And I didn't buy his little crying jag. Sorry, no. But um, <laughs> but I, I, I feel like it's almost masochistic, you know, that there's this kind of weird, uh, you know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm a gay man, and therefore I can be harder on this character then obviously I can't do that with with a black man. I can't do that, you know, with women. So I'm going to do that with this um, closeted gay man. Thank you. That's interesting. I think that's interesting. But he is the the only one that has sex. So there is like this kind of that sort of stylized or expressionisticness of his like contorted body. It's also sort of standing in for like he does get to do whatever he wants. And he gets to, like, t you know, totally um, push aside her huge sacrifice of bringing it. Okay, that's done. Now let's talk about my He deserves it. <laughs> it's cruel. It's, it's interesting that the, that the relationship, that, that Frank's gay, gayness is more acceptable to Eleanor than... Raymond's blackness. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that conversation, I was, you know, she can accept Frank. I never thought of Frank. Um, but then she says, well, I've been talking to Raymond. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm sure if I can deal with this. Mm -hmm. 
But that's also, of course, because it, un it critiques the closeness of her own relationship with Kathy, because when Kathy's like, he's the only one I can talk to, and it's mm -hmm. not you at all. So, I mean, again, there's all these, like, very close relationships between women that, you know, whether it's Kathy and Sybil or Kathy or Eleanor that have a kind of, you know, I don't know exactly how we would characterize them, but that's the real unthinkable in a way in the movie. In the movie. Yeah. And so I, in a way, feel like she's jealous of Raymond. She's mm -hmm. jealous that Kathy went to, to him. But I do also take your point. I think that it is true that that's how it hurts her to think. Yeah. Any other um, quick report? Oh, yes. Hi. Um, so my question is, do you think that this film aims for emotional transcendence, as mm -hmm. in like transcending genre? And do you think that's a function of melodrama, or, they, or is it trying to explode melodrama? Mm -hmm. um, I do think that, um, I do think it aims at emotional transcendence. Yes, I think it, it ultimately does. There's um, Jonathan Goldberg's book, uh, Melodrama, which I was looking at this weekend, has a chapter about it. Um, and he actually has a reading of the scene in the art gallery. And when they're, you know, the, the two of them are looking at the Moreau painting. And he's saying, it's, it is an abstract, Jonathan Goldberg says, it is an abstract painting, but there are recognizable things in it. There's like a moon. And there's one of the circles that actually does, and I was looking when I was watching this time, look like an eye. And he says, oh, maybe the, the, is the painting looking at them? And maybe that's the gaze of the film, actually, is like looking out from the painting of Moreau. And I think Raymond has this line about like, you know, art, modern art has replaced religion. There's this transcendent thing. It's just, you know, form and color. And I do think that Hayes, it, Haynes is such a, you know, centralist and aesthete and, you know, drawing on that long line from Oscar Wilde all the way, you know, all the way through. So I do think it has that. Um, I think that's baked into the melodrama. I think it's not unproblematically baked into the melodrama. I mean, I think um, I was actually just teaching uh, Lauren Berlant's book, The Female Complaint, um, last week. And she has this, I think, really biting critique of melodrama, which about the ways in which it sort of takes specifically the history of African-American suffering and tries to universalize it and make it the sort of reference point for all suffering. I think that the film, I think this film is aware of that, but I don't think it like sidesteps that issue at all. <laughs> um, and it actually kind of reiterates it in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't think it explodes the melodrama, but I do think that it aims toward that kind of transcendence. Um, so but that's a wonderful question. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I think that it does in a way aim for that, but I think that for means that is never separate from also analyzing. Analyzing, you know what I mean? Is always for him to analyze is part of, of that. Yeah, I think there's transcendent emotion yeah, along with this other, but but I I do think that there's a way in which the melodrama components um, that the film is trying to say, okay, melodrama can, oh, there's all that melodrama allows, but there's things it can't allow so that it does, it does have that critique that everything's going to be in terms of like personal relationships or, or transcendence or love and that it can't, and that there's false equivalency, you know. And, and, and that that's where it's, it, the film itself stumbles, but it does present like, oh my God, there's never any way to resolve this within this, you know, um, whatever diagram of desire. Because that's precisely where it can't be solved. Like, that's the realm of the melodrama. That's exactly where the problems it deals with can never be solved. Maybe we have time for one uh, last question, uh, Aaron. Uh, so sort of extending the, the question about color, um, you have taught, you have this film, which is set during autumn, you have Carol, which is very wintry. But in both these films, you have these very sophisticated colors that are very saturated, very odd. You have these corals, these lilacs, chartreuses, bluish grays. And I feel like you see them often enough that, it, like you said, the color is doing some great work. So I was wondering what you make of these very mellow, yet somehow incredibly saturated colors. Well, do you think there's a way in which the the the... the War, like, like the clash of colors is really important to the, um, yeah, the, the design of the film and the kind of perhaps thought of the film, right? That these things are not 
but that that's just a little piece of yeah. an answer. Uh, I think Scott Higgins actually has an essay that does a like super close color analysis of like the entire construction of the film. So if you, Scott Higgins, um, so if you if you um, if you're interested in in a breakdown of it, that's available. But um, I mean, I was trying to track it as I was watching a little bit. But one of the things that I think is nice is that it doesn't do the like one to one thing, right? It's not like oh, the blues when she's sad, right? It's like it actually kind of doesn't you know do the expected. Um, it works more, more, more poetically and evocatively. Um, and yeah, it is like the mellow drama, like it's the melody, right? It's like, it, it, it's a theme and variation kind of. And I think it, um, yeah, it can't necessarily be sort of like schematized so, so easily, but um, I, people have tried, so I <laughs> couldn't probably read it. The fact that they are yeah. colors that are so much that you are forced to notice them, that mm -hmm. they never, that the mise-en-scene always stands out so that you are forced to, in a way, notice the surface of the text itself. Yeah. And to think about textuality, right, is, is you know, again, part of the work of it, I think. Right, and you also have that scene where he says, you know, you have, you have to look beyond the surface of things. And, and that sort of almost seems to be a clue that these beautiful colors seem to be hiding something so much more sorted. Thank you. Also, the 50s just had really good colors. Like, go, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, just sort of showing off color values. So you'll get like bizarre corals and chartreuse. So a nice little film festival you can have. <laughs> Is there anything that any of the three of you really kind of felt needed to be said about this film that we haven't managed to say or point out? Or Viola Davis. <laughs> Viola Davis. So, so, so I was about one thing that just just about watching this film 20 years after it was made and not you know getting all a tourist about Todd Haynes in fact maybe going against that a little bit but there are so many ways in which his subsequent film because he's cast um, you know, Julianne Moore again and then Julianne Moore's meanings have other things now on them that I just that to me is something to just think a lot about and then just think what her presence you know how it kind of opens up this film in ways that, you know, it should, right? But and she should exceed being yeah. framed in this way. And she's a Rhode Islander. Uh, if we had realized that, we would have tracked her down in order <laughs> to participate. Um, thank you very much, Lynn, Leon, Patty. Please hold the book it's, up. And yeah. It's got great pieces from on um, all of Todd Haynes' films. Uh, yeah, through one extract. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for coming.